tickets fifteen dollars. Hmm. November fourth, two thousand twenty-three. I read that when I was looking. Mm -hmm. hmm. Einstein. And most of these mine supplies they take out of your paycheck. Oh well, sure. So they just give it to you, and then the, these are small cars. <laughs> Looks like a prison right. train. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the number nine mine tour and museum. My name is Zachary, and I'm going to be your guide for the next hour or so. Before we even proceed into the mine, we can see the first point of interest on our tour, and that is the entrance of our mine. We call that the portal, and above which you'll notice two dates, 1855 and 1931. That is not a start and end date, but is actually two beginnings in a way. Because 1855 is when these tunnels were first dug, and they began to extract the rock and coal from underneath the very mountain we stand upon. 1931 is when the mine received major refits and overhauls to bring it up to the operational standards of the 20th century, predominantly the widespread introduction of electricity into our operation. That's also when the modern concrete portal you can see there was constructed. The third missing date from that portal should be 1972, as that is when the mine officially closed and ceased all operations. What we are left with is the oldest continuously operating deep anthracite coal mine on Earth. It had an operational lifetime of 117 consecutive years. In 2023, it stands as the oldest tourable deep anthracite coal mine, sitting today at 168 years old. Wow. Now, as we board the train, I do ask that you all please keep in mind these low door frames as they are made of steel and usually the human head is not. <laughs> in addition, there are some low beams running the length of the roofs inside as well, so just when you think it's safe to stand up, it probably isn't. I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions to ask on the tour. More often than not, it's actually something I'm going to address in my presentation. But if it's not something I get to, hang on to that question and there will be plenty of opportunities to ask it. I do see a hand up over here. Uh, is that pin supposed to be out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to make it. <laughs> 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 Outside. That elevation actually does serve two purposes. We'll wait for the car to hold on out. I'll see you in about an hour. Hey, look, it's a 
Now here we arrive at the Go Devil. The Go Devil was in fact this little four-wheeled cart right here. What this cart would do is ride upon the smaller set of rails and in doing so fit underneath the cars of coal. Physically grab them using the mechanism you may see inside of it and then move those cars all throughout the mine that it had access to. Now this one you may have noticed really could only come up to about here into the passing branch we just left. To that extent, it would not have been the only one. As a matter of fact, there's another go devil just on the other side. This one in particular actually had a twofold purpose. The first would have been that of a repair shop. It was easier, cheaper, and more efficient to repair broken or malfunctioning equipment underground than it would have been for them to cart it all the way back out to the surface. Keep this in mind that during the operation of the mines, coal had the priority. Everything else that could have been loaded on a coal cart would have been considered just another expense. So think of it this way. Why load up a car full of Broken drills, and that car can instead be rolling out into five tons of anthracite. Aside from that, this building would have also served as the office of this level's foreman. Now, each level had their own foreman, but they all had the same responsibility. And that would have been to come in at the beginning of the ship and simply take a tour of their respective level of the mine, ensuring its structural safety and stability, while also guaranteeing the miners against any hazardous quantities of water or gas, while also ensuring that all the company provided equipment and utilities were functioning up to their operational standards. Then they would leave, only to return at the end of the ship. They would have simply taken a head count and ensured that every man that had come down here was accounted for and that no accidents or incidents occurred on the ship. Now looking through the doorframe, you may have noticed the thermometer. That needle, in fact, does not move. It will remain 50 degrees Fahrenheit down here regardless of what time of year it is or what's going on back outside. Now that does lend itself to some interesting effects, the foremost of which is going back to the groundwater. As I mentioned, it will flow every moment of every day, and as a result of that temperature, it will never freeze. During the operation... It's really saturated. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Lights in the mine went out. <laughs> I've come back out here, and I turned my lantern as high as I can get it. This is close to the level of light you would have seen with that open plane headlamp back on the mule boy. You can imagine a 15-year-old having to come in here with not much brighter than this as his only source of light for 10 hours a day. So maybe this is how our miner in the example I've been going right on actually got hurt. Is he was up in the chamber going about his business, drilling holes, planting explosives, shushing light material into the chute, when the flame on top of his head started to flicker and dim. Now that miner was stranded inside of that chamber, scrambling to relight that open flame on top of his head. Surrounded potentially by all this water, making the wick damp and impossible to relight. Surrounded perhaps by black damp. He may restart the flame, but it's going to go right back out because he's got no O2 to keep that flame going. Surrounded perhaps by fire damp, methane, that he runs the risk of igniting and burning up the entire chamber and himself in the scramble to relight the headlamp. And believe it or not, it can actually get worse. Because dynamite was not invented until 1870. Prior to that, the miners here and throughout much of the world were using explosives made out of black powder, with an open flame as their only source of light lighting. And if you imagine methane being nasty when it goes up, that opinion is going to change very quickly. Jumping ahead to 2023, resting atop my helmet is a more modern example, a detachable and rechargeable LED headlamp with two brightness settings, a low and a high. Standing here, it's almost like one of these light bulbs is back on, isn't it? You can see just the sheer difference in the amount of light this provides if I look to the left. And we can see almost all the way back to where we came from. Go and turn lights back. Good. 
shit. Look. Well, that's much better. <laughs> now, one of the things I didn't mention back to the mule boy is what they would have done if they did find large quantities of hazardous gas and dust. Among some of the things that is going to happen is they're going to establish some of those after they evacuate that area. What you should see when you are standing is the portal and sunlight coming in through. But what you see instead blocking your view is what we know as a granite. This is basically a tarp material that they would establish to create a kind of barrier or wall that would help them regulate the flow of air throughout the mine to get those gases and dust to the mine's airways, one of which can be seen when we start to make our way through this tunnel here. This tunnel, as I mentioned, is formerly a section of the primrose vein of coal. This was mined very early on in our operations here in the mine, around 1858, only three years after the opening of these tunnels and only a few prior to the beginning of our American Civil War. Now, as we make our way on through here, I do ask, I see your hand up. As we make our way on through here, I ask that you do please keep in mind that low I beam, as this is the lowest point in the tour right here, and I can hit this with my helmet on. But if you'll follow me. Is there not in my email? No. Is there not in my no, you would never store dynamite in the mine. Anywhere you store dynamite had to be a specific, had to be a certain distance away from the mine itself and any flammable buildings. That's why that other building back outside is essentially a hardened concrete bunker. That's where they would store the explosives and they would all be kept separate. You would have your blasting caps in one room, your fuses in one room, the dynamite itself in another room. Oh, we can come up a little bit more. Just checking. Because <laughs> you got to see right here. Standing right here, if we look to the ceiling, we can see actual anthracite coal still left in the mountain. Oh, wow. This shiny black rock you see reflecting my headlamp is what ultimately paid for the whole party. And it's a good demonstration of the nature of the vein, too, averaging roughly nine and a half to ten feet wide. As you can see, that extends all the way to the opposite side of the chamber. Meaning that just like the diamond vein we walked through earlier, this entire tunnel was once formerly solid anthracite coal. Wow. Now, you may ask, why is that still there? They cannot mine every last ounce of coal out of the mountain. They do that, the mountain is coming down on top of them. Mm -hmm. But they still need to mine that coal a little more excessively to create the airways that I mentioned. One of which can be seen just right here. This extends up into the mountain for about 60 feet and averages roughly 24 inches square wide. The purpose of this is it eventually reaches another tunnel, just like we're standing in now, known as either a crosscut tunnel or what the miners used to refer to as a monkey tunnel. The purpose of which is to allow air to circulate throughout the mine, because those tunnels connect every available chamber, airway, passageway, well, walkway were. tunnels. Everything. Yeah, we're now walking. Now, I encourage you all to take your time and getting a good look at that airway there. While you do that, I'll get out of your way and I'll wait just over the Imagine if all of this caved in. We'd be stuck here. They never say, that's right, they never say no. exactly that. Some of which can actually be seen on the wall just over here. Excuse me. Now I am going to need some room for this one. I got it. <laughs> you come on in a little bit this way. That one looks like a jackhammer. I'm not going to start swinging. <laughs> Now, the first example, and one of the older examples, and my favorite example, is this simple iron rod. This is called a jumper steel. And how this works is basically this would have been their drill before drills were actually a thing. What's going to happen is the miner's going to take this bar in his hands, holding it over his shoulder. He's going to take the more pointed end of the rod. He's going to plant that end into the rock face. And while he does that, he's going to slowly rotate this bar in his hands while his labor working behind him is going to strike this end here, this roughly half-inch target, with a sledgehammer. Hard hats, nor reliable forms of lighting, had yet to be invented nor standardized. By the time they were, the mines were already well into the introduction of power tools and equipment. 
such as these two drills here, which would have been powered by some form of compressed air or steam that would have usually been fed into the line you can see in the ceiling above you. Now using all of these tools here, the miners were mining exclusively anthracite coal. Anthracite coal, much like almost every other form of coal, does not form in clumps or deposits as some media may have you believe. Instead it forms in what we know as veins, long stretches of material that were formed and shaped as the mountains here grew and evolved. Here in northeastern Pennsylvania, the veins of anthracite are so massive, they go through many different communities, even entire counties, to such a degree that many of them have earned their own unique names in order to be distinguished apart from each other. Here in the Nine, for example, we go through four such veins. At the platform we exited the train, the Orchard Vein. At the first Go Devil, the Primrose. Just up ahead of us, the Diamond. And even further than that, the Mammoth. One of the larger veins of coal on Earth. Now, as we do make our way up there, I ask that you do please keep in mind those go-devil pulleys embedded on the floor in the left side of the tunnel. We don't want to see anyone trip and get hurt here today, but if you'll follow me, we can go see the diamond game. That's way down there. That tunnel behind you there, going all the way through into this one here on my left, was once formerly solid anthracite. It's a good example of the nature of the coal fields that I was telling you about, as this one vein in particular extends for about 60 miles. Now devoid of such coal, it becomes a passageway, one that serves a number of different purposes, that of the state and practicality, but the foremost of which, here, would have been that of its namesake, the mule way. This is how they would have moved the mules between the first and second levels of our mine and then the second and the third. Now this passageway extends for about 200 feet at a roughly 40 degree angle downwards. It's formerly a set of stairs that were carved out of the rock. Now they've been eroded over the decades by the groundwater. But the first problem for the lead people leading the mules down this passageway is that when the stairs were intact, each of them was about this tall. That is a 30 story climb down and up. I don't recommend it. And it gets even worse when you consider that the people most often leading the mules down this passageway typically looked not much older than him. Wow. You need to understand the grim reality of this industry in that we predate many of the governing safety organizations and laws that oversee today's modern workforce. And child labor. OSHA, child labor laws, and especially a degree of common sense. As a result, understand that during the era, typically almost every male in a household who could have worked in the mines would have done so, even the children. <clears throat> Let's say we have a young boy around the age of six or seven. He would have not been in school, instead he would have been working here in the anthracite mines. He would not have been underground per se, instead he would have been back out on the surface, working in a place we know as the coal breaker or the coal colliery a massive structure where the coal was taken to be broken down and processed once it left the mountain. Now unfortunately none of our anthracite breakers still stand today, but what he's doing in the breaker is working as what we know a breaker boy. It would have been his job, alongside about a dozen or so other boys his age, to sit inside of the breaker on top of chutes, not too different in size from the goatable track I'm standing on top of. <clears throat> it was their responsibility to sit on top of the chute and reach into it with their bare hands into a flow of rock and coal. Imagine all this was moving, reaching into this flow and picking out anything from it that was not anthracite. Rock from the wall, debris from the timbers, God forbid a piece of the breaker boy sitting in front of them. And I mean that. It would have not been uncommon to see a breaker boy missing a part of a finger, or if in some of the more dramatic cases, most of his hand. And the breaker boys account for the youngest deaths to occur in this industry as well. As they got older, they could have worked a number of different jobs in the mines, amongst that of which may have been a mule driver. Now, around the age of 14 to 16, it would have been his responsibility to lead these animals and the coal cars they carried all throughout the mines that they can get to. Basically, he would have been nothing more than a go-devil. In fact, in the grand scale of the operation, the mule held far more value than the boy that led it. 
The point to be emphasized here now is not necessarily the boy himself, rather his head. As resting atop his head is a simple, soft canvas cap. This was not designed to protect him in any way, but rather solely to hold this little headlamp on the front of him. What this was was an oil and wick headlamp, essentially a glorified lantern that produced a roughly two to three inch tall yellow flame that would have been his only source of light for his working day prior to the invention and standardization of carbide chemical lamps and electrical headlamps. The point to be taken away from that now in regards to the flame is the other danger that I mentioned with the formants is that they would have come in looking for water but also for gas. Mine gases here come in two primary forms. Each is largely a blanket term referring to a wide variety of different gases that fall into one of two categories. The first of which we know as black damp. What black damp is is any gas that causes a decrease in breathable oxygen that is not combustible. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen. Typically it is odorless and colorless, but it is more dense than air. It hangs to the floor, and if enough should accumulate, a miner will asphyxiate. The other kind we deal with is called fire damp. And as you can imagine, now that's any gas that does largely the same, except now it is combustible. The big one we deal with here is methane. Methane is also odorless and colorless, but it is lighter than air. It hangs near the ceiling, near his open flame headlamp. At which point it is important to remember that the smallest spark or flame, such as the one on top of his head, will ignite methane, as methane is a remarkably flammable gas. And if enough should accumulate, methane becomes highly explosive. So how best do you think the miners would have protected themselves? I would imagine that many of you have heard the canaries in the mines. While this was true, the nature of our operation here in the nine really didn't permit the usage of canaries. It was just too loud, it was too modern. At that point, it didn't really matter, because remember, these mines started in 1855, 40 years after 1815, when an English scientist by the name of Sir Humphrey Davy invented what we know as the Davy lamp. What the Davy lamp was, was a small cylindrical lantern that housed a small flame inside of fine steel screens. The purpose of which is it allows air and gas to enter that lantern and affect the flame in such a way the miner can accurately tell exactly what kind of gas is present and how much. The two things the canary was incapable of doing. Please excuse me. <clears throat> Up until very recently, we operated by almost that exact same piece of equipment. Except today, it would have taken the form of the modern flame safety lamp. This is not much of an evolution on Sir Humphrey Davy's original design, just using modern principles of design, materials, and science. How it works is let's say the air here may have been allowed to become stagnant, black damp may have settled. Now they're going to check for that as they're going to take their lantern and they are going to hold it near the floor and observe whether or not the flame decreases in size, goes out entirely, or should change color, as different gases can affect the color of flame in different ways, if they should do so at all. One way for the miners to tell exactly what kind of gas is present. Now on to the big one, methane, fire damp. Understand which occurs naturally in the geological processes of the rock and coal around us. 